warm welcome to all the participants here this evening and a very, very warm welcome to our speaker for this evening, Shivendra Singh Dungarpur. Um, I welcome you, Shivendra, on behalf of the Thank you. chairperson of the CSMBS and the trustees of the CSMBS and the director general of the CSMBS and my own committee at the Museum Society. We're really delighted to have you address us. I think this is for the second time that you'll be speaking to us. Am I right? That's right. Thank you. Yes. So thank you so much for acceding to our request. I know that you're in the midst of a lot of seminars and a lot of restoration work. And I'm very happy that you're here today in our midst. A few words about this topic because we've only taken a small component this evening. We've talking about women pioneers of early Indian cinema and what brought them in and who brought them in. So historically, women have had to overcome, especially in our country, innumerable barriers to gain their rightful place in the patriarchal society of India. And in, women, indeed, all over the world have had to do this. So too did women in 20th century India who had to overcome social taboos before they started performing in front of the camera to gain a foothold in the world of celluloid. At the very beginning, we have Durga Bai Kamath and her daughter Kamla Bai Gokhale, who were the first women to be cast by Dada Saheb Falke in his 1913 film Mohini Basmasur for which they were ostracized by their community. This left the door open for another group of women to slip in and take roles in the silent era, the Jewish community women, the Anglo-Indian women, who were not bound by the same traditions as the Hindu women and the Muslim women of those times, giving rise to a flock of rather glamorous screen goddesses of the silent era, and we're going to see quite a few of them today. However, with the arrival of the talkies, they faded out and Indian women did slowly but surely establish themselves as a very integral part of the film industry, playing an influential role in a medium that captured the imag imagination and the hearts of a nation from the very first Lumiere Brothers screening in Mumbai, Bombay then, in way back in 1896, we have already celebrated the century a decade ago. The talk for us today is very well conceived and conceptualized. It illustrates with photographs and I had a preview, very unusual clips that will tell a fascinating story of some of these remarkable pioneering women who have really left an indelible mark on the pages of India's cinematic history, covering a period from the 1920s to the 1950s. Saraswati Bai Falke, the wife of Dada Saheb Falke, commonly referred to as the father of Indian cinema, and the glamorous Jewish Anglo-Indian women who you will see, like Patience Cooper, and Ruby Myers, who we illustrated on the invitation for you, who became the earliest screen goddesses, followed by Durga Bai Kote, Shanta Apte, the stars of early Marathi cinema, and Fatma Begum, the first woman director, and her daughters, Zubeda and Sultana, stars of the silent era. The influence of the courtesans like Jaddan Bai, followed by Devi Karani, really she was a stunning beauty, who helmed, helmed the iconic Bombay talkies with Himanshu Rai. Of course, fearless Nadia, the stunt queen, who you will also see, who has become a cult figure today. T.P. Raja Lakshmi, the first woman actor, director, and producer of the South Indian film industry, to name just a few. They were path breakers and change makers who broke the mold and made a significant contribution to the growth of the largest film industry in the world. Thank you, Shivendra. We are all looking forward to this wonderful feast. Thank you. But let me just say a few words about our wonderful speaker for this evening. 
Shivendra Singh Dungarpur. Shivendra Singh is an award-winning filmmaker, producer, film archivist, and I can vouch for it, restorer par excellence. He is the founder of Film Heritage Foundation. It's a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the preservation of India's cinematic heritage. Shivendra was elected to the Executive Committee of the International Federation of Film Archives in 2017, and again, brings India great gain and fame a second term in 2019. Our congratulations to you. Thank you. Under the banner of Dungarpur Films, he has directed and produced close to 800 commercials. He made his first feature film, feature documentary rather, called Celluloid Man in 2012, and that won two national awards and traveled to over 50 festivals around the world. His second documentary, made in 2015, titled The Immortals, premiered at the Busan International Film Festival and won the Special Jury Award for the Best Film in 2016. His third documentary, titled Checkmate, In Search of Jiri Menzel, is a seven-hour epic that is an in-depth exploration of the Czechoslovakian new wave that has won critical acclaim from cinephiles around the world. British Film Institute and Sight and Sound magazine voted this film in the top five releases of 2020. Oscar-winning screenwriter and director Alexander Payne has hailed it as, and I quote, one of the greatest and most fascinating film docs I have ever, ever seen, end quote. I do not wish to stand between the visuals and the speaker this evening. So with all of us, with me, my Museum Society team and the team at CSMBS, a very, very warm and cordial welcome to you, Shivendra. And now I request the technical team to switch our screens and hand you over to the speaker. Enjoy the evening and ask all your questions at the end. Thank you so very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Professor, for those wonderful words. And uh, I really I want to thank you for all the support. I want to thank uh, the Museum of Society uh, for, uh, for inviting me and the CSMVS, the entire staff, and everyone who's worked towards uh, getting this, uh, uh, this talk going. Well, when, you, when, you, uh, when I was asked to talk about women pioneers of Indian cinema, uh, you know, it's not something which I do most of the time, even though I, I'm a student of film history and, uh, and as an archivist, as a restorer, uh, one is constantly, uh, constantly coming across a lot of material uh, or interacting with, with, uh, with women like Kamini Kaushal all the time. Uh, so, the perspective which I had to take was uh, also with the fascinating part of history, which I have uh, sort of met people connected with them or dealt with them or preserved some bit of their material. Um, and to look at it from a purely, not so much, because so much has been spoken about the social context uh, and the political context and also the historical context of what was happening in India at that time. But to look at these individuals, because we have a limited time of 40 minutes, uh, I didn't want to take away from who these women were uh, when we are going to talk about them. But also, I wanted to share some of the images, the photographs, and some of the videos of these, these fascinating people and some of my favorites, you know, really, if you look at cinema history, uh, these iconic ladies, uh, why were they not around today for us to take cinema into a different league? Also, uh, my talk will end with the end of the talkie, with the end of the studio system. I'm not going into the era of Meena Kumari, Madhubala, because so much has been spoken, so much has been seen, so much YouTube videos are flooded with them. So with Newton and that generation of film, of film actors, which, which 
were also pioneers in many ways in different reasons. But my talk would end with the end of so-called the studio system. Uh, let me let me start uh, with with I think what Firoza said right at the beginning. But let me start with three crucial points, and I'm going to keep it very simple so that so that we enjoy the whole process and not flood you with lots of names, lots of things. You know, we all know that the first Indian film was uh, was conceived and made in 1930. Uh, there is, of course, a controversy about whether it was Torne or Falke, but always my theory as an archivist and a preserver is that 1930, when Raja Harishchandra was made by Falke, uh, it was shot in Bombay, but he went and ended the film in Nasik. And uh, the whole debate about whether the Hindi film industry originated in, in Mumbai is untrue. It, it all started in Calcutta. So the Maharashtra was for Marathi films. And Falke was making it silent, but the whole, if you really look at it, uh, look at some of the early silent films, you can see them speaking Marathi in that, without the sound. So when you look at 1913, you have to look back at what was happening in theater, especially in the Parsi theater, and what was happening in India around that time. And the three key things which we understood, one was that acting in, in, a, in a theater, even in theater, or was absolutely a taboo for women. You, know, you couldn't even imagine a woman being cast or a woman doing a theatrical play in those days. And when it came to cinema, it continued to, to even films. And the first female roles were enacted by men. And, you know, it's a very interesting story which I want to tell you about Bal Gandhar. He's the famous Marathi singer and actor and he's known for playing female characters in Marathi who plays. When Kamla Bai Gokhale, the first female actress we will talk about, she went to him and she said that why don't you allow us to play the roles uh, in your plays? And he turned around and he said, what will happen to all the men who are playing women? Because you are taking us out of our jobs. So in a way, it was not just social, but it was also a large part which had become the norms and an economic reason why you would find a lot of men playing the role of women. and. Beyond that, they didn't want any entry of women to be playing the roles of women anymore. When Falke started Raja Harichandra, we're going to see a clips. But before we see the clips of Raja Harichandra, uh, the role of Taramati, the film is about Raja Harichandra and Taramati. Uh, and there's the famous pawn sequence. And if you ever go to Nasik, you can still go and see you can find Falke's house. You can still go and see the pond. Obviously, it's in a different shape now, but uh, the pond still exists. And what was interesting was that Falke was not very keen to cast a woman in that role. Uh, but somehow, Saraswati by Falke, his wife, said that you should try and look. And he went looking at, you know, he couldn't even find a prostitute to play that role. And finally, he did find one prostitute. And uh, she, poor thing, when she got to know that she has to be in front of the camera, she just one day vanished. And again, he had to search. And whom he found was, uh, was a cook uh, by the name of Anna Salunke. And uh, you know, he, he cast him for the role of Taramati. And we're going to see this in the clip. And he paid her 15 rupees in those days. And, uh, she, you know, he had feminine features and he enjoyed. But what is interesting is, we're going to see another clip just after that, is a, from a film called Lanka Dahan, made in 1917 by Falke. And look at what he did. He casted Ram and Sita. Both. He casted Anna Salunke playing double role in that film. He was also Ram. 
and he was also Sita in the film. And that was fascinating for me, you know, because to think in that manner that, and, and the audience to accept that, the fact that, that he's playing Ram and Sita. So we're going to watch both the clips, one after the other. Let's have a look at, at Anasabuki playing in Raja Harishchand. And you can see in the pond below, is that's Anna Salunke. Uh, and uh, you, you, you can and you can see here Lanka Dahan, and you will see in a in a particular portion uh, Anna Salunke coming in both the roles. And that's Anna Salunke again. And this is you can see both it, him as Ram and him as Sita. Well, we, even though we talk about the role of, of, of uh, women uh, not in front of the camera, it was played by men, but there was Saraswati Bai Falke, one of the most important figures in in, I would call her the first film editor, uh, literally, because she was married to Dasa Falke. She was working along with him. But what was amazing about her was that not only that she believed in the kind of films he was making, because, you know, Falke started off with mythology. Uh, most of his early films were based on mythological figures because, because in a way, they, they could be looked upon as what was happening around in that country with the British rule, he was making these mythology films. And he himself was inspired by Life of Christ, which he had seen. And Saraswati Bai was uh, not only working tirelessly on the sex, but she was mixing film developing chemicals. She was perforating film sheets. You know, those days used to get film roles uh, without perforation, which used to go into the camera or used to be processed. And she would indigenously created a sprocket to actually punch the film reads. And she would even use white bed sheets as light reflectors. You know, in the hot sun when Daza Falke was shooting, she would stand there with those white bed sheets. And more importantly, you know, for me, she provided the strong emotional support to his dream and even sold his jewelry, uh, sold her jewelry so that she could go to so that he could go to London to learn the art of filmmaking from Cecil Hepworth and buy equipment. But it wasn't so far away that there was a film called Mohini Bhasmasur, which was made by Falke. And he came, he came across Durga Bai Kamath. That was the only film she acted in. And her daughter, Kamla Bai Gokhale. And they both acted in that film. Durga Bai was a pioneering female actor already in a theater film company. And she was born in 1879. And she was married to a history teacher at the JJ School of Arts. And when the couple parted in 1903, she decided to bring her own daughter, Kamala Bai, on her own. And they would travel, Durga Bai Kamat and Kamala Bai Kamat would travel onto the theater circuit. And being homeschooled, uh, she began acting on stage, Kamala Bai, from the age of four. And Falke cast Durga Bai as Parvati and young Kamala Bai as the lead in Mohini Basmasu. And it was filmed in Nasik, uh, where you know, the pawn sequence was also filmed and, uh, that, you know, Palke had around his house, which is still there. Uh, I, I still don't know why they have not called it the national heritage or why they have not preserved it. But uh, I had the opportunity to shoot for my film, Sir Lloyd Mann, there. And the pond exists uh, where they lived, that room exists. And uh, that is where the film Mohini Basmasur was shot. And th the film was basically an episode from Hindi epics. And uh, Durga Bai had an unwitting hand in beginning the process of, of actually changing the opinion about actresses. And Mohini Basmasu became, you know, pioneering in many ways. It was the, it had the first 
female actor and the first female child actor of Indian cinema. And uh, even now, uh, their great grandsons are still acting in the film. The same family uh, legacy is going on. If you know of actor Vikram Gokhale or the late actor Mohan Gokhale, uh, who are who are well recognized, they are the grand great grandchildren of Durga Bai Kamal. But uh, and Kamala Bai Gokhale, of course, acted in about 35 films and she went on to act in many films. Uh, but what was, uh, what was interesting in their, in their uh, career or, or there was an interview which she gave for Cinevision uh, was very interesting and I want to quote. She said, no one encouraged a girl to take up film acting as a career. We faced fierce opposition, particularly from actors who were playing female roles on stage. We were their first natural enemies. They hated us. Some companies would actually not have women performers as a matter of policy, like Bal Gandharva. He wanted my husband to join the, his company for a major male role, opposite his female roles. And when my husband accepted only on the condition that myself and my mother should also be taken into the, into the company, Bal Gandharva refused. So that's how it was looked on, but the ostracization, the fact that Kabla Bai and Durga Bai are the only film actors uh, in that period of time and how the Brahmin community really ostracized them actually paved the way for a very interesting sort of, uh, sort of uh, outlook towards Anglo-Indian actors, Jewish actors. But well before that, J.F. Madden, uh, um, J.F. Madden, if you all know about him, like what I said, Calcutta became the hub of the Hindi film industry. The reason being that the seat of the British Empire was in Calcutta. And J.F. Madden, who is actually a pioneer of establishing the movie theater, I mean, I call him uh, like a movie mughal, like what you call a corporatization of movie theaters. Uh, at one point, the Madan theatres owned 127 theatres, controlling theatres right from Burma to Sri Lanka. And they also produced a whole lot of film. But this vacuum of, of between uh, Kabla Bai and Durga Bai, uh, Madan established in Calcutta, started a contract of number of European technicians and directors, including an Italian director, called Eugenio Ligero, and he casted uh, an Italian actress uh, by the name of Rina Di Liguro uh, to play the lead because there was a huge vacuum for women to play the lead here. And uh, that was the first instance of where we have a great amount of, uh, of relationship of number of Italian films, thanks to Madden. But it was interesting because it was not just Vina Di Liguro, but it was Eugene Di Liguro's film, Nana Damenti, in 1920 that produced the great female star of Indian cinema. In fact, the first great female star of Indian cinema by the name of Patience Cooper. Now, if you, Patience Cooper was an Anglo-Indian from Calcutta, could be described as, again, like the first important female star. She had a very successful career in both silent and sound films. Cooper began as a dancer in Bandman's musical comedy. And she, when she joined J.F. Madden, uh, she had a huge impact because some of her films became blockbuster hits like Nana Dermenti, Zerin, Saab, Pati Bhakti. She's believed to be the first woman to play double roles in Indian cinema. She played twin sisters in Patni Pratap, 1923. And what is the unfortunate part that the films I'm talking about, none of these films exist. Uh, just to recap about that we made close to nearly 1300 silent films and 99% of the silent films are gone. 99%. What we have is just fragments or four or five complete films. And it's tragic that, that none of these films are there for you to see. But, but apparently what 
has been written about, what had been talked about, or people who have survived and given interviews. And the fact that Patient Cooper was alive to 1983, uh, we've been able to piece together that, that her double role was, was something to look at, where she played twin sisters in Patni Pratap in 1923. She acted in about 40 films, finally retiring in 1944. And uh, was what was her great achievement? You know, people talk about uh, why did Patience Cooper succeed? Uh, her distinctive feature was that she had a great Hollywood look because, you know, Madden's at that time were also exporting uh, and importing a lot of films. So a lot of Hollywood films were coming and, and uh, the obsession with the white skin, which, which the Indians began at that period because they started seeing these Anglo-Indians acting in these films. But what, what they lacked is that because the films were silent, uh, when I say silent, it, films are never silent. You know, there was always, in the silent film, there were always musicians playing uh, in the theaters to the, to, to the visual. But when you had these Anglo-Indians working and the obsession with the white skin, there was something very distinctive about Patience Cooper. Her dark eyes, her sharp features, ebony hair, light skin tone. And it allowed the film technicians, the silent film technicians, to experiment with imported techniques of eye level lighting. And you know, they wanted to achieve very similar to what the Hollywood stars of the silent era was there. Now, if you look at that period, uh, it took a while for acting in films to attract women from, from traditional Hindu households or Muslim households. And we have spoken about how Jews and Anglo-Indians got in. And some of the very prominent names of the uh, Anglo-Indians and, and Jews are Ruby, Ruby, uh, Ruby Mares. Now, you look at this amazing photograph of Ruby Mares. This is from a film called Wildcat of Bombay, uh, 1927. Again, the film doesn't exist. We have this wonderful photograph in our archive, uh, the original uh, photograph. And you also had Florence Ezekiel, who became Nadira, or Susan Solomon, who became Feroza Begum, or Esther Victoria Abraham, uh, became the famous actress Pramila. But it was Solochna's fashion sense, Pramila's stunt, or Rose's persona, which actually etched in our memories and which really makes what is called history of Indian cinema of the early pioneers of Indian cinema, because it's just amazing. If you look at the stunts, uh, which Nadia did after that, but it is the, the, the uh, sort of shell was sort of uh, put together by Solochna, Pramila, Rose, Nadia. Now, if you look at someone like Solochna who started, uh, you know, she worked as a telephone operator when she was approached by Mohan Bhavnani of the Kohinoor Film Company. And, uh, you know, there was a time when they said that she was earning more than the governor of Bombay at one time. And the titles of films also would have Solochna starring, you know, because Solochna became the star of the film. I mean, if you look at all these titles, you will see that her name comes right in, in on top. And uh, she owned the latest models of cars in 1927. And what is so interesting about Wildcat of Bombay? Wildcat of Bombay, she played eight different roles from a Hyderabadi gentleman to a blonde bombshell. I mean, this amazing eight roles. We have a lot of photographs from that film, but unfortunately, no visual film survives. And you know, it's tragic that I would have loved to see Sulochna playing eight different roles. Uh, and even playing a Hyderabadi gentleman. She was, of course, awarded the Dasa Falke Award. And she was what we call uh, the first superstar. Patience Cooper would be the first female star in that sense. But the first super superstar was, uh, was Ruby Mayes, uh, who was known as Solochna. Um, and, and you can see that she worked in different companies, uh, Imperial, and, and uh, that was one of the big production houses. But the other actress to, at that time, to come in prominence was Pramila. She was a Baghdadi Jew. She worked as a teacher in Jewish school in Calcutta, where she was discovered, regularly played the vamp and did 
daring stunts. She was also winner of the Miss Pageant in 1947. And in 1930s and 40s, she acted in a series of films alternating between swashbuckling, stunt roles, and even doing vamp roles like Tufani Tiruni, Dilawar, Janma Bhumi, Hamari Betia, uh, Bijli, you know, so many films. And uh, she went on to also, you know, establish her own production company in the early 40s and produced something like 16 films under her banner. Um, and at, at one stage, a very interesting story I have, at one stage, Pramila used to go to Pakistan quite often because uh, she had an office in Karachi to distribute films for production company. This is well after uh, partition and things. And intrigued by her frequent trips to Pakistan, Moraji Desai, who was the chief minister of Bombay, had her wrongly arrested as a spy. Uh, because, because he says, why are you going continuously to, to Pakistan? And she was arrested as a spy for a while. Uh, but not only, you know, what was amazing about her is that she not only designed avant-garde clothes, uh, and she was deeply inspired by Art Deco geometric patterns, but she also asked Adesha Radani of Imperial Studios to work on the costumes and sets of the second Technicolor film, Mother India, long before Mehboob Khan had made his film. So she was, uh, she was someone who had so many facets around her and was, I think, a true pioneer in many, many ways. Now, you can, you can clearly see that whether all these ladies were being launched and were found in Calcutta. And you can well imagine the role Calcutta had right till the beginning of cinema because of Madden, because Madden cinemas were declining in 1927, like between 1923 and 1927, they were declining. And uh, also for the fact that when the early studio system came in, some of the greatest stars of, of the early talkie era were all from Calcutta, whether it was K.L. Segal, Prithviraj Kapoor, Durga Khote, they all were part of the new theatres. And we're going to talk about that uh, just a while ago. But should we only look at Calcutta and Bombay? Actually, filmmaking started in three port cities, Chennai, Calcutta, and Bombay. And that's one of the reasons which I keep talking about in my, uh, in my lecture about what has really happened to films in these, why we lost so much of these films. We lost so many of these films because they were made in nitrate. Nitrate had highly flammable kind of qualities. But what is really important is that they were also, these films were produced in the port cities, which had high humidity level, whether it's Chennai, Calcutta, and Bombay. And that is why we see that number of silent films which have disappeared and number of films which have gone. Uh, it's, it's a shame that we have lost 99% of our heritage. But in Chennai, also at the same time, there was a man by the name of Nataraja Mudalia. He's called the father of Tamil cinema, but I would call him the father of the South Indian cinema. And, you know, he was an automobile uh, uh, you know, garage owner and he would sell parts. And he made the first in South Indian film called Kichaka Vadam. But even in his films and those days, it was very difficult to get, in, especially in the South, uh, women to act in films. And he had to also find Anglo-Indians like Marine Hill. And they had to change the name as Vilochna uh, or Mrs. Elliot of GPC for some of the earliest film. In fact, some of the British, you know, he would, he would, he would travel, he would go and look for women who could play the part. And, and uh, he was obviously very, very adamant that, that he should actually get women to play the part of women. And uh, that led to a lot of Anglo Indians uh, to, to come forward and uh, act. And he was able to find these two women. Now, when you, when you sort of look at that period, the most important character or the most important stunt queen, I would call her, was fearless Nadia. Now, but Nadia was uh, born in Australia. She came to India as a little girl um, and she started her career in 1935 with the Vadia movie tone 
called Hunter Valley. And over the next decade, Nadia went on to star in over 50 films like Diamond Queen, Frontier Main, Jungle Princess. But I wanted to see a clip of Nadia. I know many of you may have seen, but let's see a clip of Nadia because it's just amazing to see uh, that the kind of stunts in every single film she would do from swinging from the chandelier, jumping off cliffs to fighting the speeding train. Uh, so let's have a look at a clip from Nadia. From the clip from this point of view. You just see all these stunts were performed by her. I mean, and, uh, this virtual medium doesn't allow us to have longer clips and it, it, and it doesn't play that well. But this is a film which you must see is Frontier Mail and you can see Nadia bashing up people. Uh, and it's just amazing the kind of stunts she did. Uh, and she's, of course, the first stunt queen. But when we look at uh, another stunt, in our Indian stunt queen, and a lot of you would not have seen that, was Lalita Pawar from a film called Gallant Hearts. Uh, it's, it's a 1931 film. And how many of you have seen this clip? Let's play this clip and you can see how swashbuckling Lalita Pawar, we all know Lalita Pawar as the, the, the bad woman or in, you know, those kind of roles. But Lalita Pawar is a swashbuckling lady. Here, okay, let's see the link. Just amazing to see Lalita Pavar. Fighting away and even jumping, jumping over the stool. You know. um, we have this film and we love to show it at some point, Gallant Hearts, uh, which was actually directed by uh, her husband, a future husband in that. But when you look at the 1920s and the 30s from the silent era, kissing was not a taboo in Indian films. You know, you had Lalita Pawar, who said to have done kissing scene in the early 20s when she kissed her co-star without inhibition as J.B.H. Wadia remembered. You know, he talked about that. Or you have Throw of Dice, or you have Zarina, or you have the longest kiss of four minutes in a film like Karma uh, between Devika Rani and Imanshu Roy. There is also Martand Varma, the first Malayalam film, which has a long kissing scene. Um, so, so where did this taboo come in from? Even though women were acting, where did this actual taboo come from? Let's see the scene from Karma. And I want to show another clip of Martand Varma, which is a Malayalam film. Uh, the first Malayalam film uh, in the sense that this is the only surviving silent Malayalam film made in So, you know, in 1927, uh, the British were getting very worried about, uh, about what was happening in our films. Um, and they set up a, a censor committee, a so-called censorship committee. 
and the new act of censorship came in very quickly. And it was during that period that women who were, I mean, you had quite a freedom in terms of censure, in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of kissing, suddenly went into a censorship. And you would see that change after the 1932-33. Uh, and uh, slowly by 1940, it was really a taboo to even kiss in that. And then, of course, in the 50s, we had the flowers coming in between. And it became worse and worse as the years went by. So the censorship, in many ways, had a, had a very impactful uh, change which lasted for nearly 25 years. And, and today we are, we are part of the censorship which has been put together in 1952. So nothing has changed for so many years, though so many things have all sort of evolved. So you had, to, you had to find ways in that time to be able to show a man and a woman uh, together in the later half of the 1930s. Now, now, just to understand a bit about the silent era films, which, which lasted till 1931, 1932, and the beginning of talkies, which was coming in the 1932, 1933. And apart from the Anglo-Indians and the Jews, there was, there was two very, very important women pioneers, I would call them. One is that it also paved the way for a lot of courtesans. But there was a very interesting uh, women pioneer by the name of Fatima Begum. Now, the history goes that she was the wife of Nawab Saab of Sachin. And one night, along with her three daughters, she escaped from the Nawab Saab's palace because she had interest in making films. And she landed up into Bombay. Now, where is Sachin? Sachin is a princely state near Surat in Gujarat. And she came here and she set up the Victoria Fatima Film Company. And most amazing that she went on to direct her first film in 1926, which was called Bulbule Paristan. And her daughters, Sultana Shehzadi Zubeda, became silent film stars. And before I start what is Alamara, uh, I just wanted to talk about that, that Alamara was made in 1931. But the, the influence Fatima Begum had, her studio was in Bandra, and it was called the Victoria Fatima Film Company. And along with her daughters, because many of the films, uh, Zubeda, who went on to be a huge star, and, and many of you who live in Bombay, uh, Zubeda went and married uh, the Dhanrajgir family. There's a Dhanrajgir Mahal uh, next to the Taj, which, uh, which, where she was married to, finally. And, uh, but her mother, Fatima Begum, is truly a pioneer who not only directed, but saw to it. And uh, th there are various theories about how the daughters were picked up. Uh, and various people have told me that, that when she ran away from, uh, from Sachin and she came to Bombay, uh, she was sitting in a theater uh, with her kids. And there was a Parsi gentleman who approached them and said, would you want to act in, you know, your daughters are pretty, would they would want to act in a film? And she got interested. And she said, not only them, but I have a story, I have a script. And she went on narrating the script. And in fact, he was so fascinated that he, he bought the script out of her. And, and, and she became what is called the first writer in many ways, and then went on to direct. Now, we do not know if the truth of the story, but the fact is that she, that she was so fascinated with cinema that she was willing to leave Nawab Saab's palace and leave the Janana, you know, where the women were, and to enter a world where her, her three daughters also became the superstar. So Fatima Begum is India's first woman director. 
but talkies were sort of coming in silent era was sort of was sort of diminishing and it was difficult for the anglo indians or the jews to be able to speak dialogues especially in the hindi you know uh, or the or the various uh, languages which were which were evolving whether it was bengali in calcutta or whether it was tamil in in, in chennai or it was hindi in and this is also the era of the of the studio era which which was coming in because i would divide the two eras as 1913 to 1924 as what i would call it the cottage industry period and in that cottage industry period there was only one mogul and that was jf madan and the studio period from the 1920s to 1940s now you know when you look at falke he may have started the relationship between finance and film by raising money from you know he was raising money from traditional uh, indian sources and that relationship lasted for a decade but adeshar irani who's called the father of the indian talkie cinema well before uh, well before uh, we are going to look at uh, the growth of the talkie uh, but adeshar irani is the father of uh, not only alamara but uh, he was the father of the first indian talkie but during this period we are also going to look at the three most important studios of that time one is prabhat in pune new theaters in calcutta and bombay talkies in bombay and these three are going to play a very crucial role in uh, in the rise of some of the most important women pioneers which actually set the role they were going to play in the future but let me just talk about zubeda's alamara it was a film made in 1931 it was the first talky film uh, it was a film which is not surviving today even though the studio remains if you all of you have gone to kennedy bridge um and you can see jyoti studios that is where alamara was shot that is where adesh rani shot his famous film and that is what set the path for the talkies to come in and zubeda became an overnight sensation in fact because it was talking and it was mostly talking and singing it also had a swashbuckling star by the name of master vithal and many of you who would not know master vithal had jumped studios and acted in that film which also had actors like prithviraj kapoor lv prasad and many such people master vithal because he jumped that studio his lawyer was mohammad ali jana who had to fight to save him from the other studios to file a case against him so that he could continue to act with imperial which was adesh radani studio now the sound brought in like what i said a whole new avenue for actors to be able to speak the dialogue uh, and it also rose to the you know what rose is the singing stars because playback in that time uh, i don't know how many of you know about this that uh, very interesting that when you have a camera and you have an actor performing in front of you few inches away out of the camera magnification will be a whole troop of musicians so in those days a star had to be also a person who could not only speak fluent dialogues but could also sing and the musicians will follow and that is why you see the early cinema there wasn't much of camera movement also they needed to be shot in times when there was no noise so when alamara was shot it was shot in the night because it was the studio was next to uh, the station very close to chandni road and uh, you would have frequent passing of trains so they chose the night and a lot of photographs you will see that that zubeda is singing and the musicians are following her and the camera is only capturing zubeda 
but the musicians had to so so it was very tiring for even for the musicians uh, because the, if the takes would go on and on the musicians would also have so the studios brought three most iconic i would call it women pioneers devika rani from bombay talkies shanta apte and durga kote from prabhat and kanan devi from new theaters and reason why they are all important is the backgrounds which they all came in well before that we have spoken about the backgrounds we have we have spoken about the early cinema where there were no there were no women except durga bai kokle and kamla bai they were brahmins but they were ostracized then we had the influx of anglo indians jews italians but lots of courtesans but the studio system the changing period of time brought in people from brahmin family highly educated family uh, people with, with with great amount of dignity in that sense and if you look at devika rani uh, she was the great grand niece of rabindranath tagore she was educated in a british boarding school she she had a chance meeting with himanshu roy in london and roy was so impressed with devika's exceptional skills that he invited her to join the production team of the film and uh, together you know they worked really as a team because devika rani was not only acting with him but they readily agreed they were assisting in costume designing art direction they they traveled to germany for post production and uh, they worked with some of the some of you know they learned and they worked with some of the great german film industry uh, filmmakers like fritz lang g w papst and uh, when devika rani and himanshu rai returned to india uh, himanshu produced a film called karma uh, the clip which we saw uh, where you where you saw devika rani and himanshu rai and this was the first talky it was a joint production from india germany and uh, united kingdom and this was the first talky which set the ball rolling for bombay talkies and which became the main studio in bombay and established the hindi film industry what we call the hindi film industry uh bombay talkies was founded in 1934 and uh, you know many of you who do not know the studio would serve as a launching pad for some of the greatest indian stars ashok kumar leela chitnis dilip kumar raj kapoor madhubala and mumtaz i mean the name dilip kumar has been given by devika rani ashok kumar was a lab assistant we know that he was launched in bombay talkies so bombay talkies became really an iconic but it was devika rani with with films like jawani ki hawa jeevan nayya janmabhoomi achhut kanya and uh, savitri izzat and and the and the kind of subjects she was choosing the kind of role she was playing whether it was of a dalit girl whether it was you know it changed the whole social and 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 thematic ideas of films in that time and we started looking at them from a very different angle and i'm going to play uh, you know a song from uh, which is a tragic love story between a low caste girl and a brahmin boy but it was a huge success this is a song from uh, from achhut kanya mai ban ki chidiya but what is really important about this song is i'm going to talk about this very very important music director in fact she, she was a parsi women khurshid minochar homji who went on to be the first female music director and this was her music which we are going to see and a lot of people a lot of you have heard this song but let's see the song mai dal dal ur ja Bye. 
song um, but it's not just devika rani but it's this amazing woman saraswati devi and, and you know we talk about all along we talk about that uh, the uh, the the way the parsi community they so forward in, in their thinking but when khurshid minochir homji she was you know educated middle class parsi family she along with her sister were disciples of the famous teacher pandit patkande and you know when both the sisters sang for a film for jawani ki hawa in 1935 the entire parsi community rose against them a parsi community paper launched a vicious campaign against them in himanshu roy and the unit was even threatened and to avoid condemnation khurshid she was forced to change her name to saraswati devi and her sister became from manik became chandraprabha and notwithstanding these obstacles khurshid found a firm footing in the film world and became a key player of bombay talkies and where himanshu rai gave her a free hand with her music and she set up a separate music department assembled a group of skilled musicians and you know at those days they had tough competition from the new theaters which had the great kl segal but she still khurshid is remembered for her compositions in films like achut kanya jeevan nayya durga navjeevan azad just amazing that what she had to undergo and for me devika rani and saraswati devi will be the two pioneering women of that time uh, who really changed the way cinema was being looked upon and uh, many of you uh, would would not know that mughal e azam was launched by bombay talkies k asif with k asif and the music director was saraswati devi way back in the 40s and it was it was later because the producer shahid alakim he sold the famous studios and they had to find another producer uh, that it changed hands and noshad came in and the actors changed and thing but the film was launched with bombay talkies production and with kasif as a director with saraswati devi as the music director another woman we are talking about the early entries of of courtesans at that time but one such woman who people remember now as nargis's mother was jaddan bai again jaddan bai was settled in calcutta uh, she was uh, an amazing personality her transformation from a courtesan to a singer actor filmmaker uh, you know she, many films she was the daughter of dilip bhai a famous courtesan jaddan bhai grew up in calcutta where she was trained in classical music uh, also uh, you know her reputation grew because her mother was a famous tabahif she performed in maharaja's courts in bikaner jodhpur indore but what is amazing is that within 4 years of her entry into films she started her own production company called sangeet films and the company produced in 1935 a film called talash e haq which is not available again and she not only acted with her daughter nargis as a child artist but she also composed the music and uh, in 1936 she acted directed and wrote the music for a film called madam fashion so these were really iconic women parallelly as part of the cottage industry not part of the studio system who were following in the same years but painting waves by by not only playing music but also directing films now we talked about prabhat and i think we are running short of time but i want to quickly talk about two women of prabhat uh, who are going to play a very very important role in the years to come one is of course shanta apte shanta apte uh, 
you know, she became the decade of singing stars, like what I was talking about, like Kanan Devi, Kale Segal. And she brought a change in the static style of song renditions. And when she got her first break with a film called Amrit Manthan, um, which is uh, in 1934, which was directed by V. Shantaram, she played the role of a young girl, Nirmala. And uh, it, it's a film which got her a lot of accolades till she got her lifetime film called Kumku. And very interestingly, she was such a strong personality because Shantaram talks about her being so strong uh, on the set. But it was in 1930s when the Film India criticized her for acting in a film. The editor of Film India, Babu Rao Patel, who was a ferocious gentleman and a journalist and fearless to the core. And he was, you know, if people have heard of him, he was regarded as a terror of journalism. And Babu Rao was a giant in the field of film journalism. But uh, Shanta Amte entered his office with a whip in her hand. She whipped Babu Rao Patel to the utter horror of all present. And for one, Shanta Amte's whip became mightier than the sword-like pen of Babu Rao Patel. The most interesting part of the story is Babu Rao published the whipping story in his magazine itself. And Shanta Amte, of course, is, uh, you know, she had several disputes with the studio, even went on, on a hunger strike to protest, to pressure Prabhat Studios to let her out of her exclusion co contract. She also wrote her autobiography. And uh, one of the most very strong personalities of that time. And here is one clip from Kunku, uh, one of my favorite clips in Marathi, which was made Dunya Na Mane in Hindi. But it, 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 it is a Prabhat film uh, of that time. Rajele Prabhu ne Jagahe was in Prabhat, the most dynamic of all of them, Durga Kote. In 2000, in a millennium issue, India today named her as 100 people who shaped India. Nothing. Durga Kote marks the pioneering phase of women in Indian cinema, as she was the first woman from a respectable family to enter the film industry and break the social taboo. In popular memory, the name Durga Kote, you know, for all of us, uh, would bring to mind the determined and formidable character of the Empress Jodabai and K. Asif's magnum opus, Mughle Asim. But Durga Kote, given a background, you know, she studied at Cathedral and John Cannon High School in Bombay, did a BA from St. Xavier's College. She got married as a teenager and by the age of 26, Durga Kote was widowed mother with two sons, Bakul and Harit. She had to seek work in to support her children. So when the great filmmaker V. Shantaram decided to cast Durga Bai, as she was known in the industry, as the heroine in this re remake of Raja Harishchandra story in 1932, Ayodhya Raja in Marathi. Uh, in fact, the novelty of someone of Kote's background acting in film was so immense that the advertisement for a debut film proclaimed introducing the daughter of the famous solicitor, Mr. Lord. And Mr. Lord was truly progressive because when his daughter first film, Farebi Jal in 1931, sank without a trace, he reportedly told Devi, uh, Durga, 
Durga Bai, I don't care what the rest of the film is like, but you've shown a way for women to earn a living. And, and one of the most remarkable roles, which I think, according to me, and I've chosen that clip, is from a film called Amar Jyoti, directed by V. Shantaram. Uh, in this film, Durga Kaute plays the warrior queen Sodamani, faced with extreme patriarchy in an ancient seaport kingdom. And you can just see uh, the, the kind of intensity she had, and which, which according to me, is the, is, is, is the beginning of change in the way we look at women in Indian cinema. जिस बेटे को मैंने नौ महीने पेट में रखा जान देकर पाला उस पर मेरा उसकी मां का कोई हक नहीं वो भी एक पति नामधारी नादा नादी की मिलकी था इसलिए वो रानी मेरा बेटा मुझसे छिनवा देती फिर भी मैं चुप रहूं मेरी और तमाम औरतों की दुश्मन उस रानी से मैं क्यों न बदला लू इस बदले के लिए क्यों नजानी बनू जरूर बनूंगी और उस रानी की जरे अहकत मुझे क्या उदय पर बैठ कर बेच साफी करने वाले इस दुर्जे से मैंने बदला लिया बदला ले लिया ये ही मेरी सबसे बड़ी बहादुरी है I'm going to, because we have shortage of time, I'm going to end with the last pioneer of, uh, and I could not end with, with also with one of the clips of my, one of my favorite film actors, co-star of Kanan Devi, K.L. Segal. But I want to talk about Kanan Devi and the new theaters. You know, new theaters was just a remarkable studio, which has given some of the most iconic films. But what is, in, what is, what is important is that uh, one of the most important, iconic, which made it so iconic, was, was because of Kanan Devi. Her persona, her determination, her courage, uh, and she became a legend. And even in Bengal today, you, go, you want to hear Kanan Devi's song or musicals. And uh, she, she was an amateur singer when she joined. And even though she'd received classical music training from Allah Rakha, an eminent ustad from Lucknow, and uh, she she learned under one of the great music directors, uh, R.C. Boral, who was really the father of Indian film music. And when she joined uh, Calcutta in 1936, uh, the new theater, she was able to work in some of the most important filmmakers' work of Devki Bose and P.C. Barwa, films like Vidyapati, Mukti. But the culmination of Kanan's career, however, was her appearance with K.L. Segal as heroine in new theater's greatest music hill, Street Singer directed by Fani Mazumdar. And uh, she, she became uh, what, at that point, uh, the fact that she was able to play these roles opposite and be equal to a giant like K.L. Segal paved the way for many, many heroines like Suchitra Sen to come in in the later years to follow. So let's hear this song uh, from before I end my talk about the women pioneers of early cinema. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry because we've run out of time and there will there'll be a few questions. There was, there was much more than what I want, was anticipating and I couldn't fit in. And, uh, but uh, I hope it gives you an idea of the very early period of, of women's cinema. I would have preferred an actual talk with audience sitting around. It's much better and the clips play much better. But thank you so much 
for for inviting me and uh, i'm sorry to to sort of end it in this particular way uh, i would have anticipated that i could have finished but i know we are short of time um, so thank you very much